wheelchairtraveling.com presents an interview with Bonnie Lukowitz. I am thrilled to interview Bonnie, a mentor, boss, colleague, and great friend. Bonnie has had a spinal cord injury since she was 15 years old. I liked Bonnie the first time we met, and I continue to be astonished by her community contributions. Bonnie has worked for over 40 years advocating for and educating about physical and programmatic access to outdoor recreation and tourism for people with disabilities. She is the founder of the nonprofit organization Access Northern California. She is also the founding member of the Access Dance Company. Suspend your judgment on what you think you may know as Bonnie says, and let's hear from this warrior on wheels. Hi everyone, this is Ashley from wheelchairtraveling.com. I'm here with one of my favorite people in the world. Her name is Bonnie. Um, why, why are you in a wheelchair? What's, what, what's your story? Oh, I just thought it would be fun and then all the perks that come with it. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we all do it. Right. Um, you know, the, the Medicare rules of you, they don't cover anything for convenience, comfort, or I can never remember the other word. But um, anyway, that's off track. Uh, so I was in a dune buggy accident in Michigan when I was 15 and broke my neck C5-6 complete. And... First started using a manual wheelchair for the first, I'd say, 20 years. Um, very much resisted a motorized wheelchair because that meant I was really disabled. Um, and then switched to a uh, motorized wheelchair, oh, probably about 25 years ago after I broke my foot leg. And um, boy, was I wrong about it being more disabling. It's actually been much more liberating to be able to go pretty much anywhere I want. Yeah, yeah, I know you're 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 very active. So even even when you first became injured, um, what were your interests? I mean, what did you like to do? Were you kind of a, a city girl? Um, were you a nature person? Did you like like both? Did you like going to museums? Like, what, what did you like to do for fun in your wheelchair? Oh, I was definitely a sports and dance and outdoor person. I was very active, um, and pretty much excelled at any sport that I tried. Um, my favorite class was gym <laughs> and I studied dance and had dreams of being a dancer, uh, <clears throat> thought it would be fun to be on Broadway in musicals. And, you know, this was 50 years ago too. So keep that in mind <laughs> and, um, was always on my bike and lived not far from our elementary school was at a park. So had to across a bridge and a creek and um, spent a lot of time on the creek ice skating. Um, so I was always outdoors doing something. Yes, and you and you talked about dance. I know you have a, a, a good history with dance. Um, how, where, where did that take you? What's what's kind of your your history with, with in the dancing world? Sure. So as I mentioned, I had dreams of being a dancer growing up, studied dance for 10 years. And then when I became disabled, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought, you know, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and, but it was still a big part of who I was. And, you know, I would find ways to put music on. I mean, as a kid, I used to turn on Saturday mornings, uh, put on Santana and dance around the house cleaning for my mom without her even having to ask me. That's the kind of crazy dancer person I was, <laughs> but there had to be good music involved. And, um, so I thought, you know, the, those were some uh, lost dreams. And one day I just happened to get a phone call while I was working at a sports and recreation organization called BORP, uh, a phone call from someone saying, hey, we're going to, a few of us are getting together. We're going to explore this form of dance called contact improv. And I went, okay. And they invited me unbeknownst to them that I had a, a, a dance background and we got together and just had a blast. And uh, I was using a manual chair at the time. And one of the things that really struck me was that I had so much more um, movement possibilities partnering with someone. And that's what I really liked doing it. I never have liked solo work. 
Um, so we continued to explore this movement with people with disabilities and without. Uh, most of the non-disabled people had dance backgrounds and all the other wheelchair users except for myself um, didn't have any dance uh, background because that didn't exist for us, you know, way back when. And we uh, just had so much fun. We signed up to do a performance in a um, dance festival that had nothing to do with disability. And we got standing ovations. And I would say for the first few years, um, well, because we have, were having so much fun, we decided, well, let's make something of this and formed a nonprofit called Access Dance Company. And, um, you know, the first few years we were like, oh, are people clapping because, oh, look at those brave people up there, what they're doing. But, you know, our, our goal from the very get-go was to produce good art. It was never about making a statement about disability. I mean, that came with the territory because, well, you just can't help it when you see people moving together on stage that look different from each other. Um, and, and Access Dance still exists, right? Um, yes, I was with the company for about 25 years. I taught, that was my favorite thing to teach kids. And we toured all over the world. Uh, they still tour all over the world. Um, so it was one of the first, what we call physically integrated dance companies that started in the US at least. And there was one simultaneously starting in England. You know, it's like when you think you have a unique idea and then find out that, oh, there's other people elsewhere doing the same thing. Um, it's amazing how it happens though, all kind of at the same time though. That's yeah. That's always so so fascinating to me. I just feel like you know it's 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 meant to be. Obviously, it's it's something that the world needs, and something is in motion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure it could have happened anywhere else in the country. You know, the Bay Area being, um, you know, a big dance community and open minded, and a big disability community. Yeah, um, liberal arts and all, yeah. yeah, all of that. Yeah, definitely, it was kind of a a, a perfect storm. So definitely yeah. one of the one of the first wheelchair wheelchair dancers out there for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, performer and and so on. So obviously a very, very creative person. I know Bonnie, I know Bonnie to be and definitely had to share something about, um, you know, her, her dance history. Um, but you did mention BORP, you know, that you were working at BORP at, at the time, which is an organization that I absolutely love. It's here in the Bay Area. Um, please, please tell me more about, about BORP. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, that I was a very physical person and having a disability didn't change that. So when I moved out to California, um, and after a few other things happened, I uh, ended up in Santa Rosa at the Santa Rosa Junior College where they had an adaptive PE program. And I got involved in competitive sports and felt like I had found my place and my people and um, saw the value in being physically active and how it really helped me in my everyday living and decided that um, I wanted to help other people find that joy again. And so I got a degree in recreation therapy and did an internship in Berkeley at Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program, which is one of the first um, adapted, P adapted sports organizations in the country. And um, so I did an internship there, ended up um, getting hired on and stayed there for seven years. I uh, organized a lot of camping activities and the, the competitive sports teams and classes. So yeah, I started the uh, California Rugby League, uh, Quad Rugby League here in California with a few other people and uh, yeah. That, that's BORP. And ironically, I am back at BORP. Yes. Um, so when I was at BORP, I also started collecting a lot of travel information because people wanted, didn't want to go on a group trip per se. And so I started collecting information about where people could go camping or hike a trail. And again, at this time, it was pretty limited information. This was pre-internet days. And so yeah. I recognized that there was a lot of people that wanted to get out there and travel. Did you start with then the, you know, the Berkeley area or the San Francisco Bay area, or were you just Northern California? Where were you uh, documenting? 
um, all over the world, actually. And after I left BORP, I became a travel agent and specialized in accessible tourism. Um, you know, one of the first people in the country to do it, along with Scott Rains and um, a few other buds that uh, are still around, but not doing that work. And, you know, this was before social media and being able to promote ourselves. And so, and before the internet, so <laughs> it was challenging. And I, my biggest frustration was uh, having to rely on other people on the other end to provide the information, the accessibility yeah. information. And after a few years of doing that, I just got so frustrated and decided, well, my own backyard is a huge tourist destination, nature destination. Why not focus just on Northern California? So I left being a travel agent, started a nonprofit, my own called Access Northern California. So I'm still managing that website, Access Northern California, uh, through BORP um, and also doing a lot more trainings as well, um, you know, with more and more of an interest in, in equity in the outdoors. Uh, we've been doing a lot more trainings with park personnel and how they can make their programs and sites uh, more welcoming to people. Oh, with fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And one of the things I, you know, try to pass on is to suspend your judgments about what you think you know, because as technology is changing and people's willingness to, uh, you know, get out there, um, it's pretty, you know, that a lot can happen that didn't used to be able to happen. So besides then hotels and activities, um, what specifics about um, outdoors, like what kind of details would you be looking for, you know, to, to share with other people? Right. Um, well, first of all, photos, <laughs> getting photos of things. But, you know, sometimes, I mean, back when I started, you would see the little blue international access symbol, but no explanation as to what that meant, you know, say on a website, which were far and few between. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would investigate um, parking, uh, the paths of travel to all of the amenities, picnic tables, restrooms, trail widths, surface, barriers, um, any helpful information, no shade on the trail. Um, so things of that nature. And what I've started to do now with my reviews is to list at the top what type of mobility device was used when the survey was taken, uh, just to add another layer of information uh, for people to know about. What are some of the, the barriers that you would let people know about, you know, in order to prepare them? Um, well, first, just, I mean, the biggest barrier out there is getting information. So uh, that in itself is the barrier that we're addressing is providing <laughs> accurate information, although I still haven't conquered um, and not sure if it's possible to give real time information about the barriers because, you know, Mother Nature has its way. Yeah, yeah and, weather, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always suggest people to go out to trails at different times of the year because you experience it differently. Um, you know, I can go out to a trail in the middle of summer where things are really dry and, you know, not really have a great time and then go back in the winter and it's green and lush. And I was like, oh, this is my new favorite trail. Um, yeah. And, you know, for me, the biggest barriers are bathrooms, um, you know, and not just are they at the start of the trail, but are there any along the trail, especially if it's a longer trail? I've actually found um, just two too many times often recently where I've seen an accessible bathroom has the signage, you know, the, the door looks plenty wide, you know, it looks, it looks good, but because of erosion, the, <laughs> there's now a huge step even to get up to this right. accessible bathroom and it's just now become absolutely impossible. So um, I'd love to see, you know, like just some kind of, instead of just always having one of these steps, you know, consider having, a ramp, you know, a, a permanent, you know, a wooden platform ramp, you know, downwards, or, you know, use that cement to extend it a little bit more to create a ramp and not just a, an actual step. Well, and you know what, Ashley, recently I have taken to um, filing official complaints with our local regional park district. I really would encourage your listeners to, if you 
notice a problem and it's really easily fixed, let them know about it because definitely I've had such good response from them and they actually thank me for letting them know. Um, and it's just been a win-win. So I really encourage people to help make our parks more accessible by pointing out some of the uh, the uh, issues that you come across. Yeah. yeah definitely. No, it and doing it officially makes them be more accountable too, instead of just telling a park ranger, hey, you know, yeah. I had a problem here, but do it through their means of filing a complaint. Um, and like I said, you may not have the energy for it one day, but maybe you do another day. Um, and, and it's also because it's also not just about you as an individual. Yeah. It's like I'm making it better for everyone that's going to need that accessible bathroom. What yeah. would you love to see on, um, you know, government or just a park website in general um, to give you at least like enough information to give you the confidence like, oh, yeah, I could spend a couple hours here or, or this is of interest. I think videos would be super helpful. Um, so or if you can't do videos, then, you know, photos uh, are really, really useful. And then again, just the basics about how long is the trail? How wide is it? You know, listing any barriers that there might be. Um, mm -hmm. And the surface of the trail is, is pretty important. And also if, you know, updates, if they've recently done maintenance where they've laid a thick layer of gravel on the trail, <laughs> excuse me, for, you know, whatever reason, I, I've come across that quite often, actually. Um, and, you know, maybe it's like a mile out and then you can't pass that section. So, yeah. you know, real time information, I think, is is uh, helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. Ba yeah. Barriers and updates. Yeah, definitely. Because definitely want to be mentally prepared for for those problems. Don't want to have those things be be a surprise like, oh, yeah. hey, heads up that. Yeah, we have a nice paved pathway. But after a certain point, it becomes, you know, hard packed. And then maybe after that, then it becomes a little bit more rocky but yeah. for some people they might be able to do the whole thing but to be able to to know okay yeah for a mile it's going to be this makeup and for you know another mile it's going to be this makeup and this wide you know cross slope also is, is very important you know to note especially if yeah. we're talking about trails on you know cliff sides and stuff yeah. like that for obvious reasons um you know but there's there's definitely chairs and, and people who can who can hike these things so yeah we just sure. definitely want to get that you know that real-time information which i feel like any hiker would it would be useful for them to know as well and you know it, it going beyond just what information they provide is in the ideal scenario having more modified adaptive equipment available for people to use um you know so they can go off you know, on a rougher trail if they have a different kind of mobility device uh, that they can borrow. Um, so that that would be another ideal situation, I think. Um, so besides the website, so, you know, what would you love to see um, actually at a park? I mean, like, would it would be enough for you to have, you know, accessible parking, a bathroom, you know, and like, you know, a picnic area, or, or like a little in like a little lookout space, you know, for you just to spend some time. Would that be okay. enough for you, or would you always want to have some kind of trail or or activity? You know, it depends on what I'm wanting to do that day. If I'm just looking to go for a nice picnic at a, a remote spot, then you know, I don't need to necessarily have a trail. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to travel, you know, like an hour away to go just to do a picnic. Um, but it really just depends on what it is I'm looking for. I want varied experiences. I personally, when I go out, I like to um, do bird watching and plant ID. Um, so I want it to be something that, um, you know, has some of that to offer. And usually it's not for exercise because I'm pushing my button on my motorized chair. Um, it's... Um, yeah, so it really varies. I don't think I could give a, uh, a one answer to that question other than it's so important that if I'm going by myself, it has to have an accessible parking and an accessible restroom. Those are the two minimums. If I'm going with someone else, I can, you know, make more do with um, 
if there isn't an accessible, a van accessible space. Um, the bathroom, I definitely still need to be accessible. Yes. Um, but if I know those two things, then I, and it's not, I mean, you know, part of the joy and adventure in going out in nature is not knowing what to expect. Yeah. I mean, I, that's not for everyone. I know some people, you know, really need to know or want to know what's, what they're going to encounter. Um, but part of the thrill for me is like, oh, what am I going to find here? I mean, sometimes I've even gone on the so-called accessible trail and then seen another, you know, spur trail off it and enjoyed that one more, uh, even though it wasn't considered the accessible trail. Yes. Um, so there's, you know, joy in exploring for me. So yes, definitely in, that, that thrill adventure, what's around the corner yeah. kind of yeah. A thing. Yes, yeah, especially definitely. for you. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. I definitely have that that bug been, in me for sure. I've been on trails with you and you're a mountain goat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just a little butterfly. Oh, what's that? Let's let's see what's over here. What's around this corner? And yes. Oh, it's... yeah. And not paying attention to what's beneath the what's on the ground. It's like, yeah, yeah. Hi. Just yeah, just letting your letting your heart guide. It's it's yeah. it's it's a wonderful thing. Um so have you done many uh ranger led activities then like at at parks? I mean you mentioned bird watching. Um have you have you been on on the on some of these things and have you found them to be 100% accessible or partly accessible or you know would you like to see more of this or I really mostly appreciate interpretive hikes and um, cuz I just learn so much more um and it makes it you know that much more interesting I went on a hike recently it was an all access day out at a park um I always get to forget the name of it um, it's out towards the Delta in California and it would have been a really boring, rough trail. I mean, there's no way I would have gone on that trail if we hadn't had a ranger lead it because he was pointing out all these medicinal uses of the plants and the history and it just made it that much more enjoyable. So I really enjoy that, especially, you know, we have some great naturalists uh, that do bird watching. So I actually do seek out those kinds of activities, but, you know, there's some times where I just want to go on my own, or if I'm leading a trip or going on a group trip, I don't necessarily want to hang out with everyone. I just want to go off and do my own thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and that's, you know, I think that speaks to, there needs to be a, a range of opportunities, exactly. not just the mile trail around the parking lot that's paved. <laughs> Definitely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, and I know this is going to be a hard question, and I know I, I haven't even counted this myself, but I'm just wondering if you have a ballpark of how many trails or, or at least parks possibly that, that you've been to. Well, I do have a sense of that only because when I did the website for the Coastal Conservancy and the book, I know that for those, I looked at easily 150 either well they were either beaches um trails or parks or some of them were um just vistas um but I would comfortably be able to say it over 200 yeah if, if we're counting nationally and kind of yeah. you know lifetime lifetime internationally <laughs> yeah yeah that's 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 quite a big list that's quite uh, a big list I'm sure you're up there too <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I said, I haven't actually yeah, taken the time to, you know, to count. I know I, I've been to, I think it's 23 or possibly 24 national parks. I know I actually stopped to, to count that at one point. Um, yeah, speaking of national parks, um, what are some of your favorite national parks? And what are some parks that you still really would love to go to? Mm. And now I'm talking about national parks in the United States, first of all. Right, right, right. Um, well, I love Yosemite. Um, yes. And I was there in May after not having been for like 15 years. And it's like, ah, why haven't I done this? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is crowded. Um, so it's best certain times of year. Uh, I didn't really get to explore Yellowstone as much as I would have liked to because I was kind of just passing through. So I'd love to um go back there and explore more and Bryce Zion, the Canyonlands in Utah. I uh, just was kicking myself for not getting there sooner. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm, I'm more, I think, Western US national parks. 
um, only because I don't like getting on a plane anymore, <laughs> traveling. Um, okay, well, so like if planes weren't, you know, weren't, weren't an issue and we can just time travel, you know, yes. like that, um, where where else then on, on the East Coast or, you know? Um, you know, coast? Acadia National Park in Maine was really interesting to me. And, you know, of course, the Grand Canyon and um, Shenandoah in the Shenandoah mountain areas. Um, uh, probably would like to go back to Glacier. Okay. Okay. Um, and then definitely the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, yeah. In Washington. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. And... I would like to go and see that myself. Definitely. Okay. So now, now Canada, we're, we're in okay. Canada. Would, would you like to go see still? Oh, British Columbia, um, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. I mean, pretty much anywhere. Well, mostly coastal. <laughs> mostly yeah. Coastal. Anywhere along the coast. Yes. Yeah. I've been to Jasper or Banff. Um, I'd love to go back there. You know, most of my vacations used to revolve around going to a park. I was not one for choosing a city and going to the city. It was more about, well, what parks are nearby? Um, yeah. And I'm much more of a mountain uh, river person than I am an ocean desert person, <laughs> although I have an appreciation for both. Um, so anywhere where there's trees and, and mountains. So what about so what about the rest of the world? Um, where where would you absolutely still love to go to? You know, if it was easy to travel there, you know, like you know, unlimited funds, you know, like yeah. dream scenario, like type things. Well, I you know love to explore South America more, Machu Picchu, of course, um, definitely the Galapagos. Um, there's some places in Chile, Tierra del Fuego, um, Costa Rica, of course. I just in love with Costa Rica um and Europe you know I don't really think about well I'd love to go to the Alps um but I don't really think too much about I think mostly about the western hemisphere I guess um, yeah something that something that's drawing you yeah drawing you west but New Zealand and Australia for sure um oh yes and I would die to go on a safari but I just don't see that happening. Um, before uh, you know, we get going. I want to hear a little bit about um, some of your, a little bit more of your outdoor activities because I know you're a big cyclist. So I want to hear a little bit about you know your your cycling. You know, kind of where you've been and um, you know your involvement on you know raising awareness and you know raising money for you know Borp and um, you know our community. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, yeah. I've tried all kinds of adapted sports and recreation and cycling just does it for me. I mean, rugby had its different moments and that was a blast too. That was more of a, uh, a physical outlet for me um, and a competitive thing, but cycling is, oh, it's just, it's the closest I can get to the feeling I used to have when I would cycle as a non-disabled person. Um, and I can do it on an equal level with my non-disabled peers mm -hmm. and friends. Um, so I really, I just can't say enough about cycling. And, you know, it's one of our biggest programs at Borp. And, um, you know, with technology, the way it's been, you know, advancing and with so many, well, I don't know about so many, depending on your disability, but uh, lots of opportunities for funding to get adaptive equipment. Uh, I got my bike through the Kelly Brush Foundation and mine's a motorized, a power assist. Uh, so now I can leave the little area where I leave my bike at four because I to get off the little um, lake area that you could go around for two miles and it's kind of, you know, it's very urban. Um, you had to go up a big hill that I couldn't get up on my own. So now I'm able to cross the pedestrian bridge to the other side of the Bay Trail and go for 17 miles um, nice. along the bay. So it's, super liberating. I uh, had my friends that, uh, one of my friends that I was in my accident with, um, that nothing, you know, happened to him. Uh, we went uh, tandem riding this past May, and it was just so thrilling to be able to do it with him. And, uh, you know, he loved it too. It was, it was great. Bonnie, I cannot thank you enough for having you on the show today. I definitely want to have you back to talk about more travel issues, which I know you have so much experience with. 
definitely encourage everybody to to check out Borp and Access Northern California and of course uh, wheelchairtraveling.com. Please like the video, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you for watching and for your support.